All right, gang, we're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson tonight, but please feel free to continue to eat. So I think there's still some dessert and good stuff over there, so please get up, get something to drink, and eat as, as you need to tonight. So thanks for being here again tonight. It's good to see you. So we are at the kind of the midway point of this five-week uh, series. We're on night three tonight. Uh, oh, one announcement I do want to make before we kind of get dive into this hard, but if you haven't been out here and to the Bishop's Garden, the Centenarium, and seen the, the new fountain, it's really wonderful. So don't go look right now, but when I get done talking, <laughs> go take a look at it. So um, thanks to Maggie and Marshall Sorrell for donating to that, and I know Max and Larry both worked on kind of making that happen, so uh, it's really beautiful, so it'll be wonderful to be able to sit out there, so yeah. But do check that out tonight. Um, but we're continuing our, uh, our series on worship. Um, last week we talked about how... Um, let's see if we can get this working. Good. Uh, we've talked about how, uh, what worship in the Bible looked like, and we, and we kind of walked through that a little bit. And tonight, the highlighted night that we're looking at is worship through church history is what we're looking at. So how Christians worship kind of over the history of the church. And if you remember from last week, just to kind of remind us a little bit, because this is where we're kind of picking up from, is that over the course of the Bible, God, with the Hebrew people and the Israelites, said, here's a tabernacle to worship in. They built a more permanent structure in the temple, and they went and offered their sacrifices there. They'd bring their animals and offer their sacrifices to God. Then over time, developed the synagogue system, where people could come and study scriptures, and then the early Christian communities, the things that they started to do to worship was they started to share a meal together, to meet together on the first day of the week and share a meal. And this is really kind of what the Bible talks about as far as um, um, what the, the early Christians were doing. Now, what we're going to be talking about tonight covers 2,000 years of history. So... It's a long time frame, and because it is a long and big time frame, we are not going to cover everything. So, so yeah, thank goodness uh, we don't have to be here all night, and I don't know all about it, so I'll just talk about some of what I know about. But um, we are going to be kind of taking a big general overview over this time frame of really what we're looking at is how we got from those first Christians that knew Jesus and Jesus left, how they worshipped, and how we've gotten to today and how we worshipped, and what's kind of transpired in that in-between time. So tonight we're going to be looking at kind of four big areas, errors of worship. We're going to be looking at the early church, we're going to be looking at the Middle Ages, we're going to be looking at the Reformation, and then we're going to be looking at the liturgical movement, or this is kind of the 20th century, and what's kind of happened and how we are where we are today. So let's start with the early church. So we remember, first Christians that knew Jesus, they were still going to the temple, they were still going to the synagogues, and they were sharing this meal together. They were kind of engaging in all three of those kinds of acts of worship. And so the first Christians, they kept, kept doing that. Well, in 70 A.D., the, there was a Jewish revolt, actually before 70 A.D., in 66 A.D., there was a Jewish revolt, and they kind of row up, rose up to throw off the Roman authorities, and they kind of had an independent kingdom, more or less, for four years, until 70 A.D., when the Romans got their troops together, and they came in, and they uh, kicked all the Jewish people out, and they destroyed the temple. And so the temple worship ceased in 70 A.D. So there's no more going to the temple anymore to offer sacrifices after 70 A.D., uh, which was a bummer for the Jewish people. And it was also, for the, these early Christians, they were still kind of going there. They still seen this as an important place to connect with God. They no longer had this place to go and connect with God. So the idea of going to the temple is gone now. But what the early Christians began to imagine, even before the temple's destroyed, what they began to think about and see is that as they look at the life of Jesus and what Jesus did and his sacrifice on the cross, and they started using that term as sacrifice on the cross, they began to see what happened with Jesus was what was going on in the temple. And that what happened with Jesus really re replaced or fulfilled everything that was happening in the temple, all of that kind of worship. And so the early Christians, they were able to kind of easily move away from the temple. And it wasn't that big of a deal for them to, to say goodbye to that. Um, 
So, there's no more temple worship for the Christians. They start, they see Jesus as a fulfillment of that kind of worship. Now, Christians are still kind of going to synagogues, but as you can imagine, over time, if you've got some Christians in the synagogue and you've got some Jewish people in the synagogue, or you have some people in the synagogue that say, yes, Jesus is the Lord and the Messiah and the Savior and is the Son of God, and you have some other people in the synagogue who say, no, Jesus is not Lord, He's not Messiah, He's not the Son of God, there's going to be a big disagreement there. And so the Christians had to go their own way. right? They were no longer allowed to continue to meet in the synagogues. And that's when you really begin to see uh, the formation of this distinct community or distinct church separated from the Jewish people. So they kind of say goodbye to the temple. They say goodbye to the synagogue in, those, in that worship. Um, but they still have their meal. This is the early Christians. They started this meal, and they still began to meet together and share this meal. And they began to incorporate um, some of the things that were going on in the synagogue, like prayers and singing psalms and studying scriptures and preaching and teaching. And they began to incorporate that into their weekly meetings of their shared meal. Justin Martyr was a guy who lived from 100 to 165 um, uh, A.D. And as his name implies, Martyr, he was killed for being uh, a Christian. But uh, before he was killed... and. Uh, he wrote a, a letter to uh, the Roman emperor, and he kind of wrote a defense because these, this new Christian group is kind of rising up, and people don't quite know about them. There's all these kind of rumors going around about who are these Christian people, what are they all about, what are they doing? And so Justin decides to write a letter of defense to the emperor to say, this is who we are, this is what we believe, and this is what we do. And in that letter... Um, there's a, there's a section there where he describes kind of how they meet and what they do for worship. So I'm going to read that to you and just, I want you to pay attention and just, and then we'll talk a few minutes about just what do you hear? What are they doing in their, in their times of worship? And we afterwards continually remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together. And for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the Maker of all through His Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the President verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray, as before said, When our prayers ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which thanks have been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well-to-do and willing give what each thanks fits. And what is collected is deposited with the president, who succors the orphans and widows and those who through sickness or any other cause are in want and those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us and in a word takes care of all who are in need. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that on Saturday and on the day after that of Saturday which is the day of Sunday. Having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So, in that description, what were these Christians doing as Justin was describing their worship? Well, they were worshiping until they ran out of time. (laughs) All right, right. When they got time to read, they would just read until they ran out of time. So, you know, they might just read. And that was a common practice in the early church. They would read usually until the reader got tired of reading, so, which could be a long time. So, that's right, or a short time. That's right. So. No, no, they had no Super Bowl. So, what are some of the other things they were doing? They obviously had communion and they had an offering. All right, they had an offering. They had communion. Good. Prayer. There was prayer. Singing. All right, right, there was concern for the needy, right? And he talked a lot about that. Was this in Rome? 
Uh, we're, we're not sure exactly. He seems to be writing, he, when he, Justin was in Rome when he wrote this, but he seems to be describing in his whole thing, descri- describing generally what, he, what his view on what Christians are and kind of representing this to the emperor. Yeah, they're right. there's there's someone who gets up and talks about what was read and then talks about exhorts them to the good things that they heard, right? So there's some encouragement and challenge to to live into these things. Right, there's a sermon, right. And they they read all the scriptures, they read the Psalms and all of the other scriptures, same as we did. And then talk about Jesus' life as the thing in the New Testament as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it talks about that they read the prophets, which is referring to the Old Testament scriptures. And it also says they, they uh, read the memoirs of the apostles, which would be what we have as the New Testament. So, That's right. So the people who couldn't make it to church for whatever reason, they were sick or whatever, they, somebody took communion. The deacons took communion was to the... Was it communion or was it just food? That's, so it sounded it, to me like it's just a meal, it's just food. Good question. So, so when the, when this, <laughs> it's a good question because what happens, they first get together, what their first earliest Christians are doing is having a meal together. And that's when we, when we read like in, in Corinthians, and we read that scripture from Corinthians last week describing kind of the communion experience and talking about how there's enough there for people to get drunk on. You know, there's enough wine for people to get drunk. And there's enough bread and stuff for people to get full. So there's a lot there. So they're having a full kind of meal. So it is a full meal, and it's also communion. Okay, so they because they're still saying prayers over things, they're doing that kind of stuff. But it's it's a little bit different than what we experience. We, we have coffee hour afterwards. That's right. That's right. So, but what what are you? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So here, in this, in this letter, they're pretty certain it was written around 150 A.D., maybe 151 or 150 A.D. So you can see way back, they already, and it's really familiar to what we know in our Sunday service, right? There's a lot of similarities there. So the early Christians, they've already began to establish this kind of routine and a liturgy of what they're going to do as when they come together and worship. So... There's two big portions of their service. Uh, there's the scripture portion, so where they're going to read scripture, they're going to pray, they're going to talk about what the scripture means. And then the second portion of the service is that sharing that meal, communion, Eucharist, where they're going to bless the bread, distribute it, pray over it, those kinds of things. So you got these two big, these are the two big ways that these, the Christians are worshiping and engaging with God. In, um, so in, if you look there in this bottom, this right-hand square here, this is a, a town, Dura Europus, and this is a map from Roman Syria. So, and Dura, Dura Europus was a um, Roman garrison kind of on the, on the edge of the Eastern Empire. And this was a little city. It was an outpost out there. And in 250s, it came under attack. And to, in order to kind of prepare the city for the attack, the uh, Roman soldiers, all the uh, houses and businesses and things that were close to the wall, they filled it all in with dirt and sand and rocks, so to kind of make the wall wider. Well, in doing that, uh, they preserved those buildings because they filled it up. And so the earliest um, known church that we know of as a separate building is, was here in Dura Europus that we actually have and know that this was a church building. Before, what we know of is when the Christians first started meeting, they would still go to the temple, they'd still go to the synagogue, and then we'd get together in one another's houses to share that meal. And so the earliest Christians were meeting in homes as far as worship. They didn't have a dedicated building that they would go to to worship. So, but we know by 250, at least here in Dura Europus, that they had built a church. They had dedicated... Um, not necessarily built. They think that this building was remodeled. That's what the archaeologists think. They think this place was remodeled to make, to make it into a church, uh, to use it as a church. Um, but if you notice, um, well, let me ask you this. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yes, that's what I was going to ask you about. So good. So yeah, what do you think this is right here? So 
This is the font, the baptismal font. It's a baptistry. So this is where somebody would have been baptized. So if you, it looks like a bathtub, right? I mean, that's what it looks like. So Now, you can see, uh, they know it's churches. They know it was a church because of some of the paintings and things that were preserved there where there's biblical scenes. So the, here's women visiting the tomb here, there on the, that wall. Um, up here above, in the middle here on top of the baptistry, there's a there's a depiction of Jesus, the good shepherd, holding a lamb, and there's a, there's a flock of lambs, and he's bringing, bringing this one lamb with him. There. there. There was my arrow. That's what I was looking for earlier until Pat came. Yes. So what do you think that is? So, so but here's kind of a diagram to show kind of uh, more of how this church was shaped. So if you can see there on the bottom right, is the entrance, so that's the door. So you'd come in there, and then you come into a courtyard area, which would have been open air, you know, so it lets a lot of light in. So over here is the assembly room, or this would have been the main room where they would have met together to have church, right? They would have read scriptures in there. Uh, they would have celebrated communion in there. There's a teaching area that leads into, and that's that room we were looking at, the picture, the baptismal room there in the, in the upper right, the baptistry. So the um, earliest Christians, when they were, so they're kind of going around. There's not a lot of Christians. They're telling other people about Jesus. People are listening and believing. And they're like, hey, I want to be a Christian. So what's the way to become a Christian? You've got to get baptized. But they had a three-year process that they would take someone through before you got baptized. Three years of instruction and teaching. And so that's what that teaching area is for. You go in there and you learn. Anybody who was interested in becoming a Christian could come to the church service. But when it got time for communion, they had to leave. They weren't allowed to witness that part or participate in that aspect. So while the, everyone who was a baptized Christian partook of communion, a couple of leaders in the church would take all the people that wanted to be, get baptized and take them to another area and teach them about the faith and instruct them about in the scriptures, instruct, instruct them about Jesus, instruct them how they live together, how they care for each other. And then, after a time period, you got to go and get baptized. And immediately after you were baptized, you got to go and experience communion for the first time. And see, and, and you had never seen it before, you didn't know exactly what would have happened. So it was a very kind of mysterious experience that they were waiting for and anticipating in a way to, to kind of connect with God. So that's what, it's not something that we kind of continue to do, but it was something that was important for them as they were um, bearing witness and training disciples, training people in, in the faith. So what are some, from Justin's letter, from what we described there at the worship there in 250 in Dura Europus, how is that similar or different to what we do at St. Thomas? Yeah. And that sounds like a pretty good idea so that they understand what That's right. Out. That's right. Why they're doing that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, that went on for a long, long time. They had the catechumens that mm-hmm. really were schooled, and you just, you didn't, they were very serious about the Eucharist, and, you know, just wasn't thrown out for anything. That's right. Come. That's right. Yeah, one of the other things, too, you know, during this time period, there is some persecution, and so there's always some hesitancy before you're going to let anybody into the group, you know, because, you know, there's a little bit, who are you, what are you going to do, do you really want to be a part of us, because if we let you in and you all of a sudden can learn all the Christians, then it puts us all in jeopardy. So there's always a little bit of hesitancy there. What I don't know what the literacy was, you know, I mean... Yeah, I mean, there was for sure, I mean, there were sure you, people would have known people that were literate, and there was definitely people around that could read and write and things like that, but not a majority of the population. It would have been a minority, but I don't know anything about percentages or what they think. So, What about when you look at just uh, kind of the structure of the church? How does that compare to... All right. 
Yeah, there's a whole separate room. The baptismal font is at the entrance of the church. We have ours up there. Right. A lot of the older churches, the baptismal font would be as you come in the entrance. Mm-hmm. That's right. So. <clears throat> yeah, that looks very similar, right? Just a rectangular kind of space. They have a classroom. They have a courtyard for coffee There you go. That's right. <laughs> they got some similarities there. Uh-huh. I have a problem with the size of the baptistry. Okay. Was it by immersion? So this baptistry was, um, I forgot the exact measurements, but it wasn't deep enough probably to immerse somebody. And so probably what they did was pour, the person got in there and they poured water over the person. So like, you know, a bucket or a pitcher of water over, over the person. So there's, our records of what we know of how people are baptized are baptized in a variety of ways um, as far as whether, how much water was involved. So whether it was all the way full immersion, somebody was pushed all the way under, or whether it was just water was poured or whether water was splashed upon the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, r- a really good question, and I'm just going to hold off on answering it just a little bit, okay? But it's a really good question. It's an important question. So, but because it's a, a little bit of a lengthy answer, but we will we'll address it here in a little bit. So. So we have an idea about how these earliest Christians were, how they began to, uh, they met in homes first, and then they started building churches. But still, these were rather small places. So like that assembly room in Deir Europa is probably fit 50 to 60 people, just to give you a nice idea about how big of a place it was. So, well, uh, so we're going to move on to kind of our second time period that we're going to look at, which we're going to call the Middle Ages, which is really going to extend a little bit farther than that time period. But... Um, we need to talk a little bit about the Imperial Roman cult. Um, so uh, Augustus um, of Rome there, he started asserting himself as a divine figure as he took over control of the Roman Empire and made himself Caesar, made, made himself into a dictator. But up to that point, Romans had, uh, they voted and had leaders and things like that, and some of that continued on, but... Augustus took control, he controlled the army, he could, and he started to assert himself as a divine figure. And emperor after emperor kind of kept that up, where they asserted themselves as being a godlike person, and a person deserving of worship. Um, and some of this is that the emperors, they would specially make a big push after they took over, after somebody died, and they took over for their predecessor, they would make a very big push and say, we need to pray for so-and-so, and we need to pray to so-and-so, and... And, um, you know, he's a god. He's there with the gods now. He's going to look after us. So that, and part of that, their push to pray for their predecessor so was that well, after they died, then they would be remembered and honored in, in similar ways. So part of, and it's hard for us to imagine and understand because of our society where we have separate things, where we have church and government and business and they're very separate kind of entities. And back then, it's all wrapped up together. So you couldn't go, you couldn't really engage in any kind of governmental functions without participating in the imperial cult, without participating in worship to the emperor. So any government building would have had a little place there for the emperor, and there would have been a place you go and burn some incense, you offer up your prayer to the emperor, and you do that. Now, Christians have a problem with this. Because they say, there's only one true God, and you are not it, emperor. And so this caused a lot of problems, because they weren't really going along with the rest of society as far as business transactions, government transactions, because it all involved, you had to participate in these kinds of worship experiences. Um, And so this led to, this is where a lot of the persecution came from, because of their refusal to participate in in the worship of, of the emperor. So you kind of have this going on, and the Christians are, because of all this persecution, the Christians kind of have to be underground. They can't be really out, out 
in the open. Well, Constantine uh, becomes emperor. Um, before he becomes emperor, the, the empire is kind of crumbling a little bit. There's kind of four different people vying to be in control. He marches on Rome to confront one of these guys. And as he's marching, as sort of the story goes, and this is a picture from that story, uh, in the sky, or he get, receives a vision of a cross, if you see at the top there. Constantine receives this vision of the cross. Uh, all of his army, he, you know, other people in the army see this vision. They all put a cross on their shields and on their coats and things like that. And they are victorious in battle, and they win. So this is a sign for Constantine that the Christian God is with us. And so Constantine says, everybody worship the Christian God. And so in 312, he passes an, an edict or 313, excuse me, Edict of Milan, where it says Christians are allowed to worship God and should do so. He starts donating money from the government uh, coffers to Christian groups so they can start building churches. So during this time, the Christians now come out of the shadows, and they really have an official status um, that the emperor has recognized. Now, this has some effects upon the church, you might imagine, some big effects. Oh, that's the wrong way. There we go. All right. If the emperor becomes Christian, he controls all the government, all the businesses, all everything. Everybody else is like, well, if the, if the emperor is going to be Christian, then I'll be Christian too. So now everybody wants to join the church. Everyone wants to be a Christian. So this cre creates a, a, a different reality, getting good with the emperor. Now, as everyone's joining the church... Um, the church and society begin to merge together. There begins to be a less of a difference between what happens in the church, what happens in that Christian community, and what's happening out in the rest of society. They begin to look the same. And this is where you might have heard the term Christendom come from. But the idea that, uh, that our leaders and things are ordained by God and given special privileges to, to lead us, and that they're going to lead us as we all follow Christ together. The whole, everybody in society does that. Now, as I said earlier, too, there's a lot more money now for Christians. Not only does the emperor giving money out of the government coffers to build churches and things like that, but you got more people come to church, so they're all giving more money. You also don't have persecution going on, so they're not coming by every few days or every couple of years and stealing your chalices and you got to go buy a new chalice and those kinds of things, right? Which is something they had to do, right? You know, there would be a raid on the church. They would take all the valuable things and... The government would go and sell them and take the profits, and, then, and the Christians who were left would have to go and buy another chalice, right? So it was expensive to keep having to go, buy, go back and buy these things. So, but now they don't have to do that. So there's lots of money. And now they can use all this money to begin to build bigger churches to house bigger, all the more people that want to be Christians. Um, the, um, there's a, and so the design they looked to was the basilica. A Roman basilica was a standard building that was built throughout the Roman Empire. It was basically a big rectangular building, and they would use it to, for markets. You know, people could set up little, their little uh, booth in there and sell whatever goods they had. They could use it for government functions. You could come there and take care of business. All kinds of things could happen in these buildings. They were really common. They knew how to build them. They were easy to build. They, they allowed for a lot of people to, to fit into them, and so the Christians said, well, let's use this. We know how to do this, and so they began to build churches specifically, began to build buildings specifically to be churches, and they used the basilica as a design. Um, and so they, uh, so again, you see a big open area where you can meet and do your scripture readings and things like that, and people can gather together in an assembly. This is so the this is kind of more of just an actual picture, and then of course you have an area to where um, you can celebrate communion in this apse area in this little rounded area, which in the um, basilicas would have normally been reserved for people of honor. This would have been a place where a government official would have taken care of his business, and people would have had to come to see that government official there. Now, all of this. This, these changes had f effects on the church and how the church worshipped. So the church begins to become an institution. 
You got all these people that have to be organized, and you got to have some kind of hierarchy to know what's going on and who's going to be in charge and who's going to do what. You also start having the idea that there's professional people. There's people whose jobs are to run the church, priests and deacons and bishops and things, people that are getting paid. They don't have to have any kind of other jobs. Um, the, so they're in the schools come up, specialized schools to train all of these specialized people. Uh, people began to get um, assigned priests and bishops and things. It began to become up from on high of, oh, this place needs a priest. So priest A, you go over there and be the priest there. Whereas before in the early communities, when there wasn't any kind of connectedness because it, was, you couldn't really, it wasn't easy to be connected, people were constantly being thrown in jail and killed, and it was hard to get together to work together in any kind of big network. Also, there's just not a lot of people. So all your, anybody who's filling any kind of leadership in the role in the community always kind of came up from within the community. There's always somebody you would have known. You would have seen them grown up, and you said, oh, look, you're gifted. You're, you're going to lead us in this way now. So that begins to change the worship in that, in that way. So we're, so we're covering, what we're doing here is covering in about a thousand years. So this is slowly happening. So that's right. So once, once Constantine became, you know, he was, became the emperor, he set the law and said, Christians, you're good to go. Then, you know, everybody starts converting, start mon- more money coming in, and that changes how the dynamics and things. And so which is going to change the worship. Uh, All right. So, so the, the commitment of the average church member decreases. All right? Now, in the first couple of hundred years, if you were going to join the church, there was a lot at stake. Your, your life. You could get thrown in jail. You could have all your possessions taken. You can, your children could be killed. So, you don't, not something you're going to do lightly. Okay? But after it becomes official, no. Actually, if I join the church, it might be better for me. I might be able to make some business connections. And so the, the average commitment of people lessens. There's still some very faithful people that were very committed and continued to wanted to follow Jesus. But there are also a lot of people that maybe weren't as, as committed. So the other thing that begins to happen is that liturgies and theology begin to be standardized. So this is a, during the, t- in the 4th century, during the 300s, actually... Constantine called the bishops together to write the Nicene Creed. Okay? So that creed that we say every Sunday morning, that's our basic statement of faith. He said, look, we need to come up, we need to be unified here. And so that happens. And so you can't just kind of believe whatever you want. There begins to become standardization. The liturgies, what kind of prayers you're going to say, the kind of the order you're going to do them in begins to be standardized. They're going to be able to talk and have those kinds of conversations other effect is that evangelism becomes less important. It goes into decline. Um, if everybody in town is already a Christian, who is there to tell about Jesus, right? Everybody kind of already knows. Everybody's already joined up. So you don't really need, it's not as important to spend three years telling you the ins and outs of what it means to be a Christian because you kind of just grow up with it. You just kind of know it. You just kind of see it. In your, you see your parents. You see your grandparents. You see your neighbors living it. So you just learn. You pick up those things as you just grow up. Um, they don't have to spend a lot as much time on, there's not as much time spent on discipleship and things, and there also becomes a less emphasis on teaching and reading scripture and being taught from scripture because everybody kind of, it's not new. Everybody's heard this a bunch of times. Also, as you have this, this growth of this church and you have all, you got a, you know, you got thousands and thousands of churches and every little village there's a little church, and you've got to find somebody to go there and be the preacher. And not everybody is educated. Not everybody has the best um, skills at being able to read Scripture and understand it and be able to explain it. So they're not all priests really much know what they're doing besides, hey, <laughs> just to let you know, priests don't always know what they're doing. So that's right. Good, good. That's right, that's right. So, they would, so priests would have been trained, like, you just need to show up and you need to say these prayers. Don't worry about if you understand it. Don't worry about if you're able to explain it. What's important is that you can do X, Y, and Z. Because right? they just got to get all these priests trained to just do all the baptisms, to do communion, to bury people, to marry people, to do all the things that just have to happen. 
So this also allows for some more navel gazing, okay, or time for reflection and questions. When everyone's a Christian, you don't really have any kind of outside threats to your existence. It's not, you begin to wonder and you can begin to think about things. You have more time to consider questions like, so when we, when we do communion, what, what's happening there? I mean, what's really going on there? Exactly how is it that God is meeting with us? Now, you know, if you're worried about soldiers knocking on your door, you don't have time to think about it. You just want to do the service, enjoy, and meet with God. Right? You don't worry about trying to figure those things out. And then begin to analyze and think about all the different elements that, happen, that we do in worship and, and begin to think about, well, what's going on there and how might we, and what exactly do we need to do in order to make sure that it happens? So we've got to figure out what happens in communion. And then after we kind of figure out and we figure out, we think we know exactly what happens, then we've got to know, too, what are the steps, what's the process we're going to go through so we make sure that those things happen so that God will show up. You know, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to say this, I'm going to put my hands here, and if we do the right steps, then God is going to show up. And that becomes, and during this time period, is there's no threats, you begin to have time to think about this, the church as a whole. People began to, you know, kind of the idea of, of having theologians, people that just sit around and read scripture, or fund, they have money, they don't have to worry about other jobs or things like that, to study these things and think about these things. Wow, we're, it's already set. All right, we're going to fly through some of this stuff. All right, so that kind of brings us up. So as you imagine that this development would cause some problems, and some problems did begin to develop in the church. All right, corruption began to take place as the church is so tied to political offices and things and what the kings want to say. It's easy to get, you know, if the king wants the, the right bishop in there to approve what his policies and things, you know, you can do that. You can sell those offices for the highest. You can, you can just bid them out. You know, who's going to pay me the most? And you get to be the bishop, you know. And then the bishop can use that opportunity, his place of power, to, to make money. So those kinds of things are going on. Uh, things got so fixed and standardized that they were still doing the service in Latin, even though that no one spoke Latin, because that's the way you do it. This is the way it's been figured out. We know if we do it, if we say these exact words in Latin, then we know God shows up. And if we change it, God might not show up, so we're going to do it this exact way. All right. Uh, also, during the, another thing that kind of was going on during this time, too, that led to the Reformation is that people became increasingly fearful of damnation and hell. They became overly worried about being condemned to hell. Lots of pictures are being put up in churches and murals painted and things that are all scenes of judgment and death and fire. All right? Now, you don't read, you go to church, and the only thing you see is pictures around you of people burning. You know, this is what you get worried about. You get concerned about, what do I have to do in order to stay out of that situation because it looks horrible? All these pictures were very, very graphic. And so the purpose of... Any of most common people's engagement with the church was, what do I have to do to stay out of hell? And that was their sole concern that they were trying to work on. Now, these are some problems. Some people said, you know what, we need to fix this. We need to reform this situation. We've gotten off track because we, we read in scriptures, we look, and we see that, you know, God actually does love us, we think. Pretty sure. We look at Jesus' life. And Jesus isn't really talking that much about damnation. Not as much as all these pictures seem to make it think it is. So begin to think about and realize that maybe the things and the direction the church is going on and its worship and things isn't exactly where we need to be. And so Martin Luther uh, is a monk. He, uh, he's he been thinking about some of these things. He goes to the door and he tacks up on the door 95 theses, 95 statements of things that he fixes for the church. Here's what we need to change and fix to make the church better. Well, this uh, unleashes a whole brouhaha. Okay? So all kinds of other people say, yeah, Martin, you're right. We do need to fix these things. And lots of other people said, no, Martin and your followers, y'all are wrong. This is the church. This is the way we do it. And we're going to keep doing it this way. And so you begin to have divisions begin to grow and separate churches, and there's all kinds of people. Uh, now, this Reformation, um, 
was two big things just were happening in the world that allowed this Reformation to really take root. Throughout that thousand years of the Middle Ages, there were people from time to time that would rise up and say, look, I don't think we're not going the right direction. We need to stop and we need to change it. But they might say something and a few changes in a few places might happen. But in general, the big, massive church just keeps on trucking in the direction that it's going. Well, when Martin Luther did his thing, printing press has been invented. It's now easy to get the word out. You can get it out to lots and lots of people. Because there's lots and lots of things out there to read, people's literacy rates ride. They can read. They can read the Bible for themselves now. They begin to think about some things themselves. So that's going on that allows this Reformation to happen. The other thing is that there are a lot of kings and things that want to take power. And if the Pope, who's in charge of the whole church, is the really the big power, if we say, well, we don't really uh, uh, heed your authority anymore, or we don't really follow you anymore, then the kings are free to do what they want to do. And so a lot of people and political powers are very eager about this spirit of reformation, not so much because they necessarily care one way or the other about what's going on in the church, but this is an opportunity for them to establish their, their own self and for them to be in charge of their, of their own kingdoms and their own lives. So that's going on. And so here's some of the reforms for worship that began to take place. Um, we're not going to do the service in, in Latin. We're going to do it in the service of whatever people see. If we learn in Gem- Germany, we're going to do it in Germany. If we're in England, we're going to do it in English. We're going to do the service in a language that people can hear and know and speak and understand. So you're going to have an increase in lay participation. What had happened, so what had happened in the services kind of up until the Reformation is that the priests would be doing their thing and the lay people would be doing their thing. There would be two separate services going on in the same place at the same time. So a lay person would just sit there and read their little prayer book or look at the murals or do their own thing, and the priest would be up in another way distant part of the church saying their prayers in Latin, probably not even saying them very loud, doing their part. Maybe the lay person would look up and see the, the priest hold up the host or something like that, and the lay person would oh, something magical is happening, something special is happening. And they might look at it, but it was two separate things going on. Well, Martin Luther said, and other reformers said, hey, we need to, if we're here together as a community, we need to be worshiping together. And so we need to do in the same language. We need to be doing our prayers together. We're going to have everyone participate. All right. Now, for a long time, you know, everyone's kind of Christian in name, but no one really understands what it means to follow Jesus. No one has read their Bibles. There's not a lot of knowledge. So there need, there's this big push to teach and preach and for people to talk about what it means to follow Jesus because it's not really known anymore. Uh, and then there's this big push about that we've gotten too much ornamentation. Or if you read the Reformers, how they like to refer to those things as popish things. So they refer to anything that they didn't like was popish. So it was a very, very nasty word that the Reformers used. To, and they, sometimes they called one another that cause, and called one another's views on things popish. But they saw anything that was kind of looked um, very grandiose, that looked like it resulted from maybe the bishops, what the bishops are wearing, and they're wearing these really ornate and golden and all these jewels and things, and it's like those bishops have gotten that wealth through, not through good means, by taking advantage of people. And so that's all signs of wrongness. And so they want to really push against that, those kinds of things that are going in worship. Now, there is um, the big question that all these people, so they're all kind of in agreement that what the, ch- what the church had been doing was wrong. And then we've got to change it. But what they weren't in agreement with was how are we going to change it? And how different is our service going to look from what we've been doing? All right. Some people said we're going to keep it really close to the same. And other people said we're going to change it very differently. All right. People that said we're going to keep it very much the same, Roman Catholic Church. And something to remember about that the Reformation formed the Roman Catholic Church. Before the Reformation, there was only this... Western Church. No one called themselves the Roman Catholic Church. It was just the one holy Catholic apostolic church. After the Reformation, there becomes being all these options of where you're going to go to church, and everyone's got to make choices. And so, and one of those choices was, we're going to keep things pretty much the same. 
We're going to do some reforms because the Roman Catholic Church did in the Council of Trent in the 16th century did meet and for 10 years and made some significant changes in some of their practices. But a lot, as far as worship goes, they kept a lot of that looking the same. But they did change some things about as far as being able to sell um, offices like to be a bishop or a priest or selling indulgence and things. They got rid of a lot of that kind of corruption. So you got the Roman Catholic Church says, we're going to keep our worship looking like it's been looking because this is what God wants us to do. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have people like the Anabaptists who are going to say, no, we need to change all of this. If, it doesn't, if it's not mentioned in the Bible, we're not going to do it. You know, that's kind of their, their philosophy, which, as we talked about when we looked last week about how the earliest Christians were meeting in worship, we don't really know much about what their worship services looked like, what they were doing. There's not a lot there. So, if there's not a lot there in Scripture, their services, the Anabaptist services, means there wasn't a lot that they, that they had going on in their services. Now, our, our history in the Episcopal Church, as we're connected to the Church of England, on this spectrum, we would have fallen kind of like right here. All right, we changed a few things, but a lot of the way that the first Reformers continued to worship looked very similar to what was going on um, before that. They changed things like, instead of doing the Mass in Latin, we're going to do it in English, but we're still going to pretty much say the same thing. We're just going to translate it. So this big question of how are we going to worship, one of the things the Reformation does is introduce this question to Christians that we can think about and we have to make choices about how we're going to worship and think that there's options we can go to the Lutheran Church, we can go to the Presbyterian Church, we can go to the Church of England, we can, go to the, we can do it like the Roman Catholics do it. That there's, this, there's this option and this spectrums of ways of worship, and we need to cha- choose and think about that. All right. The, um, the Church of England answered that question by coming up with the Book of Common Prayer. They said, we are going to have a prayer book that details how we worship, that gives people guidance on what we do. It's going to be all contained in a single book. Now, before the Book of Common Prayer, there, would have been, there were books out that showed how to worship, but there was a bunch of books. There was all kinds of different books. The Book of Common Prayer, one of the neat things that it did was combine these, all these various books that existed and put it into one usable format. So you didn't have to have a degree in order to sift through seven books to figure out what a worship what you're supposed to do in a worship service. You just picked up one book. Lay people could just pick it up and see, oh yeah, this is what we do, and this is what we do, and this is what we do. So this is a 1662 prayer book. So there were several different editions that started in the 16th century, but the 1662 prayer book became the big one. It is still the official prayer book in the Church of England. So they've had the same prayer book for, you know, going on 350 years, or how many, what are we, 400? Not quite 400 yet, but um, they've developed other worship. No, almost no one uses that because it's so old um, in actual church services. So, and, Except when the, you know, the queen's getting, uh, something's happening with the queen, then they'll use the old one. So, But in their Sunday services, they don't use it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right, that's right. Um, uh, So, that brings us up to kind of today. So, liturgical movement. Liturgical movement is something that's taken place here in the 20th century that has revolutionized or really changed significantly the way churches worship and think about worship, considering everything that happened during the Middle Ages and everything that happened during the Reformation. Um, It's something that not everyone realizes is that what what we are experiencing right now in our lives and in our worship lives, what's going on in churches, uh, not only in the U.S., but around the world, is there's a lot that's changing and there's a lot that's, that's going on. And so it's important that we, we know that. The 1979 prayer book is a result of the liturgical movement. It came about because of the liturgical movement. So let's talk a little bit about what was going on or some causes for this movement, this, very, this big push for us to reevaluate our worship. One thing is, during the 19th century, there was um, a lot of work done and discovery and collection and organization of early Christian texts. So we're talking about from the first few centuries. 
they kind of they kind of existed, but they were in some monastery somewhere in the back, and no one really ever read it or looked at it. But people began to pull those out and began to read them and looked at how the first Christians were worshiping. Things like we read from Justin Martyr. And they would read through that, and then they would think about what they were doing in Sunday, and there was a big difference there. Other thing is that the ecumenical movement, Results of, one of the results of the Reformation was all these other churches started. There's, you know, all these churches, then we're all kind of divided, and people begin to say, you know what? Maybe it's not, maybe Jesus doesn't want us to be divided. Maybe as followers of Jesus, we should be together. And let's start thinking about what we have in common. And let's talk with one another and how we might be able to build relationships and bridges with one another instead of trying to focus on what's separating us. Well, as they're talking about what they have in common, people begin to say, it's like, oh, you do that at your church? I do that at my church too. And they begin, there begins to be this building of evidence of all these similar practices that are done across churches. Uh, advancements in transportation, communication, globalization. We think about, you know, just over what's happened over the last hundred years and how we can be able to talk to one another and communicate with one another and understand what's going on in other parts of the world and share ideas and share things and go and visit places. Other big thing is that society no longer wants to be Christian. And this has been happening for the last few hundred years, that people have begun to move away from the idea that, hey, to be in a Western society... I don't have to be a Christian. I could be all kinds of other things. I could be an atheist. I could be a Muslim. I could be Jewish. I could be a Buddhist. And so what happened in the Middle Ages in Christendom was society and the church came together. And what's happened here over the last couple of hundred years is those things have split apart, okay? which makes a big difference in how we engage with the rest of the world, how the rest of the world sees us, and affects how, how we respond and worship. Um, so the liturgical movement, some of the big things that it focused on was that it began, as they looked at those early documents, as they began to share and talk with all these churches about what was everybody did for worship, they began to find some common themes and common things that everybody was doing and these first Christians were doing. And that began to become the focus of things. They began to look at the deep structures of worship. So an example of this is that um, uh, any, was anybody here, and this is just, please be honest, is anybody here taught a specific way of how you were to receive communion? Okay. All right. So, Linda, you want to share? Well, I mean, we approach the altar. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's right. You had your hands a certain way. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Good, good. Thanks for sharing. So, so that kind of practice and, and thinking about exactly how we're going to receive communion, that's more of a surface structure, whether you have your, hand, your left hand on top or your right hand on top. So the deep structure, what they began to focus on was it doesn't really matter too much where our hands are or whether we're kneeling or standing or sitting. That's not the important thing. The important thing is, is that we're doing communion, that we're actually somebody's getting something to eat. That that's what really matters, that that's the essential action that's happening, and that's the really important thing that's happening. And they're to be a, So part of the liturgical movement is to focus on those very essential things that are going on in worship. And some of the other things that have, that have been dividing the churches about you know, whether you kneel or stand and people have been fighting and having wars and stuff about was, you know, maybe this isn't what we need to focus on. Um, other thing is the liturgical movement pushes to be the breakdown between clergy and laity. Okay, what happened over Christendom? Clergy, they're specialized people. They're holy people. They know what's going on. They know what to do. Lay people, we don't know what's going on. We don't know how to worship. We don't know what we're supposed to do. That's the kind of dynamic that it developed. One of the pushes of the liturgical movement is to get rid of that dynamic that that there's you know that that priests know some special knowledge that lay people don't know, and this encourages for there to be participation and action by everybody involved in the service, that everybody's engaged in all aspects of the service, and we're all in this together, and we're all doing things together. And a focus begins to become on building the community within the worship service, that we're building, that we're joining together, because we recognize that as society is no longer Christian, we can't just say that we're, that, you know, we're close to our neighbors just because we live next to them. 
we begin to have this, this special bond and relationship with people who say they follow Jesus. And so we, we're going to focus on this bond and this relationship that we have with one another. Um, wow. It got late, so we're going to stop there at 7.22. But any questions about anything that we've talked about tonight? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the kind of the prohibition on clergy getting married wasn't, I think, till like the 9th or 10th century. So for, for you know, first several hundred years, the clergy would be free to marry or not marry. There wasn't any. So women clergy is an interesting uh, thing. So there's, there's evidence. <laughs> this came out wrong. It's an interesting phenomenon phenomenon. So uh, there's not a lot of record of ordained women uh, as, as bishops or priests or deacons. There is some. There is some. And there's even some biblical record where in Paul and some of Paul's letters where he's saying greet so-and-so who leads the church or greet so-and-so who's a deacon at the end of Romans. Uh, I forgot the lady's name, but he mentions the lady's name, and he says she's a deacon. So there, there, is, there was evidence that people fulfilled these roles to some extent, but it's not a lot when you look at the vast majority. Did they teach uh, about the priesthood of believers? Is that part of number three? Uh, yeah, so, so, one of the, so the priesthood of believers, and really that phrase really took root at the Reformation and began to be really positive and and we're going to look. Everybody has, everybody can come before God. That you really, that you don't have to have a priest. That a priest does certain things within the community, but everybody can come and know God. You don't have to wait for the priest to show up at your house to say a prayer. Linda. That's right. Oh. Well, it, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the 1979 prayer book, our current prayer book, is a result of this liturgical movement. The idea of like having communion every Sunday is a result of this. And the next coming weeks, we're going to look at this service in detail. And so we'll be talking a little bit about what used to happen as we go through different parts of the service, what, how they used to do it, and then how we're doing it now, and why the changes, and kind of fleshing out some of these realities in specific ways in the service. So... I know I have Shirley's question from earlier still to come back to. Are there, are there other, other questions about anything specific to, to tonight? All right. I have gone longer than I told you, so if you need to go, uh, feel free to stand up and go. But I mean, I'm going to answer Shirley's question, and then I'm still going to have some time to, for anyone to ask any other general questions about, about worship. So, Shirley, um, you asked earlier about uh, communion and how before... Uh, children used to have to go through a series of classes in order before they could take First Communion. So this is a result a little bit about the liturgical renewal movement, why we no longer do that and why we permit children, once they're baptized, to participate in communion. So uh, what began to... Uh, so when you look back at the earliest Christians in those first few hundred years, the practice was anybody who was baptized, whether you were a month old or a hundred years old, you got to take communion once you got baptized. So in those first, year, first couple of hundred years, you know, you, adults, they would go through that, that process, that three-year process to get baptized and then be admitted to communion. When adults would get baptized, their children would get baptized as well. And then they would be permitted to enter into the, the community and participate in communion. So when we got into the Middle Ages and as time went on, um, they began to say, well... 
you know, there's no adults being baptized anymore because everybody in town is a Christian. We only have infants being baptized. But, you know, we probably should still teach them something and make them wait a little bit for something, right? We can't just give everything to them right now. So we need to have something that we're going to hold off from them until we can teach them a few things about God. And so that's when the idea of First Communion kind of began to rise up. And so we're going to wait till children get to a certain age. We're going to teach them a few things. And then after we teach them, then we're going to give them communion. So big push liturgical renewal movement was to begin to think about, well, what are we exactly doing at communion? What's it there for? You know, and one of their answers was, it's there for us to meet with God. It's there for God's people to meet with God. Now, also during the Middle Ages and, and even after the Reformation, the big focus was we've got to try to figure out what's going on. And if you don't understand all the ins and outs and how it exactly works, then you, you shouldn't take communion was a big teaching. And so kids, they, they don't know anything, right? So they can't do it. So we're going to hold off communion from them for, for that. Um, but as we, the liturgical movement kind of pushed back on that idea to say, no, it's not what's what important. What's not a, it is not primary focus when we do communion for us to understand exactly how God is present with us. What matters is, is that we do it and God is faithful to meet with us during that. And so one of the things that we want to confess now is, is that when we give children who are baptized, whether one-year-old or two-year-old, when we give them communion, that God is at work in their lives, that God's grace is being flourished into their life, that God's spirit is working through that moment, whether or not that child understands what's going on, whether or not we understand what's going on, whether anyone else understands what's going on, that God and that child are meeting together. And so, again, the focus isn't, you know, focus for a long time in the Christian church was we got to figure out how it works, and what we're, not, what we're trying to get away from is focusing on that, how it works, and just do the worship, just be with God. That's the, that's the, that's the priority. Does that help? Yeah, I can see that, but I think uh, I just remember how excited I feel. Mm-hmm. And the hate is going on Saturday. Yeah. To, uh, and, but they got so much out of it, and I had a child go to Baylor, which is a Bible school, more or less, and I thought, oh, dear, she's going to flunk out. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, and I think for sure we still have to, we want to have a priority of teaching our children about the faith, about Jesus, about scriptures. Uh, what we want to be careful about is making that you have to know certain things before you can meet with God in that way. Because it also raises up questions for uh, people who have low IQs or mental retardation who, who, are, who do not have the ability currently to understand these things. Well, and, truly and that's the other question, too. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Right. But one of the things I want to share, sure. we really struggled with this because we were in that era, mm-hmm. you know, when all of this, many of you are used to their, your children, and my children were babies, and we had a monk come and teach us on this. And the thing that really stuck with me is he looked and he said, Now let me ask you. Do you eat as a family? And of course, in those days, we did sit down and eat as a family. Today, that might not be a question. But said, and do you wait until your children have perfect table manners before they come to the family table? And you know, all of us mothers said, "Well, no." <laughs> and said, "Well, when we gather as the Eucharist, we're gathering as the family of God, and everyone comes as they are able." And we all receive. It made so much sense to us that all of those barriers that we had about, well, you got to learn this, you got to learn that. And then he looked at us and he said, now, do you understand what's happening fully in the Eucharist? I mean, you've been taught all these years. And it just it just was such a beautiful, and he had such a simple way of presenting it mm. that it made sense. Yeah. And that we do believe that our children are fed and prepared for life every Sunday that we bring them into the Eucharist. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and uh, I think so often 
in the church, we think that with our minds, we're going to understand God's actions. If we st- I don't, don't get me wrong, I believe we need to study and be taught. But I think so often, we think we can control God if we can understand him. And if, I, if my dumb brain could understand, we have not got a very big God. And I think, I think our children really understanding more in their innocence than we do. You know, the questions that they ask are just wonderful. Mm-hmm. And the way they receive without earning it, mm-hmm. you know. But that question for me just just cleared up everything because I was taught hard line. That's right. Yeah, but, you, uh, but Mary, you, I mean, I think what she says, some great points. And then even just your, I mean, this, this, all this stuff is recent. I mean, it's within your lifetimes about doing this push, about this prayer book, about these ideas. And this is still unfolding and taking place. I mean, in some sense, you know, I was, I was born in 1980. So I, <laughs> so my, my entire existence is post-1979 prayer book. So it's just now priests that are my age or younger that are in situations that have, a, have been taught in the seminaries that are teaching this way. Because even seminaries, it, it took a while for liturgical professors to retire, oh, and, but they were still teaching based on the old prayer books and things and not kind of the new things that were going on. And so there's a lot that's going to is continuing to unfold and questions that we're going to have to deal with because of, because of this. And, and, but it makes it a challenge for us because it's, it's easier if it's just all already figured out. And we know exactly how to do it, but we have all these things, these com- this competing tradition and history and ways that we've all communed and connected with God and worship, and that's all kind of being questioned right now. And some of it, what we have to do is to deal with those questions. So. I have to tell you that when it happened, it was when her sister was uh, a baby. I mean, she's just two years older than Anna Maria. And so I said, I'm taking her up there, and I knew Bill would give her the Eucharist because we just said we would. That's right. Um, any other, any other, any general questions about anything as far as worship goes? Yes. Um, I just wonder, you know, we are changing so much, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, and and that's I mean that's the challenge. That I mean, there's the ones that I have a really hard time with. Okay. Is the washing of the hands before Eucharist. I mean, okay, you have the washing of the feet, you have the washing of this, you have the washing, and then it's not there anymore. It just and it, and it may not be wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It just it just always seemed like you know they were preparing and they were cleansing themselves because you're you know almost like surgery. You know you're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You know and they always held their hands up. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so two questions. There. So, your your larger question is, how what's how do we find balance? And that's a tough thing. And that's why that's why the things it takes time for these things to unfurl and for us to have discussions and think about. And it's not easily. That's. I mean, we're talking about the 1979 prayer book, which is a prayer book that's over 30 years old, and we're still kind of wrestling and coming to terms what is contained there and what it's asking us to do and live, live out our lives. So, so there's not easy answers. Sorry. So, but, <laughs> so, but, so what's right. But so what, what we have to do is continue to have discussions about it. And what we want to think about is as we think about the kinds of worship experiences that we're going to create is what are we asking people to do? And how does that allow people to connect with God? How does it allow us as a community to come together and connect with God? And so there's going to be certain parts of it that, each of us might really like, and some of it that we don't really like, and but we got to kind of come together in some kind of unified fashion to agree that as far as our corporate worship, we're gonna. This is how we're gonna go about it. So, uh, 
do you want me to talk about specifically about the washing hands? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I was just wondering why. Yes. So, so, the, so the washing of hands, it developed within the history of the church as because you're going to do the communion, this is a really special time, and you're going to do this outward act of cleansing hands while you do this inward cleansing of your, of your soul before you prepare to do this, this holy thing. Um, so the reason that I don't do it is because I don't want, I, I'm trying to get away from um, making any demarcation between the things that we do at communion time as being holy or as more holy than what other things we're doing in service. So, you know, I think the reading scripture is just as important as doing communion or the sermon or the prayers or the um, singing. What's that? Offering. Or the offering. That all of those things, that this, all this, this whole experience together is, is a holy time. And that all of them are equally holy. And so what we need to do before I, we enter into worship is prepare our hearts before the beginning. You know, not at halfway through. Like, oh, that other stuff, it was, you know, it was important. But this is the really important stuff. And i got to get my hands clean before I do that. And, and so I don't want to, I think it kind of sends that message. And so I don't do it to not send that message. So does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole... There's been several times in the history... Oh, that, the 2,000 years that hurt in various places where people have said, we can't have all these images, we've got to get rid of them. And often there was violence done to get rid of the images. Like, let's go break all those stained glass windows, let's cut things up, let's burn them. Because and some of the thinking was, we're creating all these idols. All this stuff is idols. And we're not supposed to worship idols. We're only supposed to worship the true God. So that's some of the motivation behind it. Um, so the positive of having those things is, well, we're not worshiping those things. Those are the things that are there to aid our worship and to guide our worship. So, Well, I'm going to, I'll still be around if anybody wants to talk about more questions, but I'll dismiss everyone else. Be sure to go by and see the fountain, and we'll be back here next week.